and you don't need to become this sort of inflated ego, unrealistically positive person, but you know, balance the scales a little bit. You do a really good job of putting yourself down. So injecting a little bit of this optimism or positivity isn't being, you know, annoying and rosy. This is just leveling the playing field a bit and being more realistic. Hey, everybody. Before we start the show, I want to make a couple disclaimers. This show does cover a wide variety of topics related to mental health and life in general, and some of those could be sensitive for you. I want to simultaneously encourage you to be brave in consuming difficult content, but also respect and recognize your limitations. So please use your best judgment. I will never be offended if you need to skip a question or an episode entirely, but feel free to feel it out, check out the episode, and just see what happens. If you need to skip, that's okay, but you know, feel free to give it a shot first. I also need to say that while I am a psychologist, I'm not your psychologist and I'm not your therapist. This is not intended to be direct medical advice and you should not use this as a substitute for professional help. So with those said, let's go ahead and get into the show. All right. Hello, friends of all varieties. This is the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast, episode 314. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Duff, aka Duff the Psych. I make mental health content for real people, just like you. And today I have a question and answer episode. Um, Two really good questions today. Um, Nothing too intense or serious, but I think some stuff that a lot of you guys will relate to. So hopefully some good tips here. If you want to send me in a question for the show, please shoot me an email to duffthepsych at gmail.com or go to duffthepsych.com and use the contact form there. And of course, you can always use the search bar to see if your topic has already been covered on the show. Uh, The website is the best way to find older episodes of the show. For those of you that want to, um, you know, go back a bit further and, you know, see an earlier episode that I've referenced, those are all on the website. So you can check those out. Um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time here at the beginning with some more personal rambling. So if you want to skip that, just skip forward a little bit. Um, but yeah, it happened. Uh, we, we lost our little dog, Olive. Yesterday, um, we were able to, you know, get an appointment. We have a, luckily we have a humane society, uh, office that's right next to our house and it was not looking good for her. So, you know, as I mentioned before on the show, she, uh, had cancer, probably lymphoma, and it was giving her a hard time breathing. She was getting edema, meaning like fluid building up, you know, under her skin in a variety of areas. She was starting to look, you know, like a different dog. And then, you know, on it, it, it basically, from the time that we had initially taken her to the vet to get that diagnosis, uh, it seemed to pretty rapidly accelerate. So I think that, you know, the things we were noticing that brought her to the vet were a sign that things were declining. And so, yeah, from, from then to, to yesterday, things definitely picked up a bit and, you know, she was doing pretty well for a bit there in terms of, you know, she had some, some spunk, she was still wagging her tail eating, you know, you could see that she was there, but yesterday, you know, she, she wasn't eating and even things like, uh, you know, a ham or like ice cream. She was, she would give it a, her best shot, but definitely wasn't, um, you know, finishing it and, and, and not as into it as she, she would have been otherwise. And she was having a hard time walking, yada, yada. She did, you could just tell she was out of it and she was starting to isolate too, which I think for dogs is often a sign that they're, they're trying to, you know, separate themselves because they know it's, it's, it's time. And our other dog knew too. She was, you know, she's usually kind of a, well, she's a shepherd, so she usually <laughs> shepherds all of her around and, you know, pushes her around under chairs and things like that. But uh, she was a lot more sweet and just like concerned. So anyway, you know, we were like, okay, let's, let's, let's try to get this, this handled because she doesn't need to continue living like this. And uh, yeah, so we did, we, <laughs> you know, we were very clear about, about what's going on with the boys. And I think that's something that I wanted to sort of share with you guys. There's no exact right way to do this. And we're not like, you know, model parents, the best parents in the world. But I think that in this case, we handled it pretty well. You know, we were very honest with the boys about, you know, the fact that all of us been sick, you know, we let her know once we figured out that she's probably not going to get better, that, you know, that's the situation. She has a disorder that's causing her to, to have something grow inside of her that's making it hard for her to breathe. And eventually it's going to make it so that she's very, very sick and, and can't live anymore and that she's going to be passing on and dying soon. 
And so we need to, you know, enjoy the time we have left with her that, you know, once she's gone, she's not coming back, things of that sort. You know, we don't really um, have like a, a faith or a, you know, a religious belief or something like that. So we're not talking about like, oh, well, she's going to be in heaven now with this dog and that dog. But just, you know, expressing that she's been a really good dog, that she's done a great job, you know, sort of <laughs> raising the kids and all these sorts of things and um, that she's going to be you know, dying soon. And, uh, the, the boys get it, you know, Remy, the six year old is definitely understanding more than, than Leo, the four year old, but they both do. And Remy's basically just, you know, walking around saying, I miss Olive so much. I miss Olive so much, which is heartbreaking and totally valid, you know? Um, but it's, it's pretty interesting because the kids are, uh, they're kids. They're so straightforward, you know? So like we brought them over to, a neighbor's house to watch them while we were going to have all of, you know, put to sleep. And, you know, they, they go through the dorm room. He's like, yeah, we're here because, uh, all is going to go die now. <laughs> and like people, uh, uh, like we were out in the back, uh, you know, painting and doing stuff. And a, a neighbor kid came by and, you know, the same thing where he was like, yeah, I'm sad because my dog died today. And just like very straightforward about it, which I, I really like, you know, why, sort of uh, pretend like that's not what happened. It's okay to be sad about it. But we try to make it as, you know, um, normal but also special as possible. We had a little uh, ice cream party for Olive. That was uh, Joelle's idea. We had a little ice cream party. So we sat on the floor on a blanket next to her and we all had a little bit of ice cream, including, you know, our other dog Clover and the kids. And then we gave Olive a little bit as a celebration of, of her life and what a good job she's done. And then, yeah, we took the kids to the neighbors and walked her over to the Humane Society. And, um, you know, it's never it's never easy, but it was easier, you know, knowing that, like, she was not comfortable and, you know, she was fighting to, to, to stay alive and she didn't need to fight anymore, you know. So uh, the people there were very, very sweet. It was basically just, you know, two people that were in the room with us. There was a little couch. I'm saying this because I don't know if you, it, you know, some of you guys may have never put down a pet before and the experience may be different depending on where you go. So I just want to sort of demystify it a little bit. Um, it was a very sad, but very good experience. Um, you know, they, they basically get her up on the table um, and give her a shot of, you know, a combination of drugs, including ketamine and, uh, you know, I think some other barbiturate, meaning it's sedating, you know, so uh, they, they give her a good amount. And then we kind of sat with her on the couch until she got very, very dopey. <laughs> her little tongue was hanging out and she was just like, you know, breathing very lightly and, and totally out of it so that she's not, you know, scared or um, feeling pain. Um, and then they um, you know, she had so much, uh, edema, so much swelling that they had to kind of put a tourniquet on her to find a vein, which, um, didn't seem to bother her because of the medication they gave her first. Once they found one, they gave her another shot, um, of a different, uh, you know, mixed, uh, medication. And this is the one that, that, you know, stopped her heart. And so they, um, you know, had her laying on the table and she was on her, her blanket and, we were just sitting there petting her head and telling her what a good girl she is and how pretty she is and all those things. And she was just breathing and then breathing more slowly. And then eventually, you know, she stopped breathing. And um, the, I don't know what tech or vet or I'm not sure what her position is, but she had a um, stethoscope, you know, listening to her heart. And I think probably less than a minute, you know, she's like, okay, yeah, we, we don't have a heartbeat anymore. And it, you know, there was no dramatic thing that happened she was laying on her side you know and she was very still and calm and that was still the case afterward and she didn't look too different you know she still looked very much the same she looked you know if, if i saw her i would have assumed she was just sleeping and uh you know they wrapped her up and then you know we said our goodbyes and that was it and so they're gonna you know have her cremated and, and they'll let us know when her ashes are ready so we figure we'll put her in a box and have like a keepsake that you know, we can remind the boys that she's there, but yeah, it's done. Poor thing. She, you know, had a rough go of it past, past few days. Um, I'm glad that she's at rest now and she was a great, great companion. You know, I think that everybody treats pets differently and, you know, uh, I, while I'm not like the type of person where, you know, pets and humans are on equivalent level or pets are even more important than humans. You know, she still was very much part of the family. She's been with us through so many transitions, so many different places that we've lived, 
you know, she's about as old as our marriage and, um, yeah, like, uh, she, she, I'm really pleased that she, you know, was around long enough that the boys will remember her and yeah, she did a really good job and it was time for her to, time for her to, to rest. <laughs> her watch has ended and, uh, yeah, she's a good one. So this one's to Olive. Hopefully she's resting peacefully now. Um, on a completely separate note, I know this is a little bit of, like I said, a lot of rambling. This is just me today. Uh, I've been having a bit of a hard time functioning. Um, I'm not feeling like the, I definitely cried, you know, while we were putting her down and around, you know, on that day. But, um, you know, I'm not feeling that sort of grief now. I'm mostly physically uh, feeling the toll of it. So, like, I'm very tired today. Couldn't really get anything done last night because I was just, you know, very full body tired. So I've been working on this stuff this morning. So that's why I'm a little rambly and stuff like that. <laughs> but the separate note, and I'm not going to spend too much longer on this. Um, there's a really cool program out there. If you guys have not heard of it, I'm sure a lot of you guys have. It's something called mid journey. It's a AI program. If you're one of my therapy patients, I've already told you about this because I've been obsessed, but it's a AI program that lets you uh, create art using prompts. So if you type in the prompt of you know, a young boy riding on a mm, Tyrannosaurus Rex in the jungle. It'll make art that looks like that. And the more information you feed it, the more specific it can get. Pretty amazing results. If you've never heard of it, look it up. It's called Mid Journey. And if you want to see all the art that I've been creating, um, I've been doing a lot. I started to do Instagram for it. It's at Emotional AI Art. So check that out. Hey friends, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. Okay, this episode is brought to you by our sponsor, BetterHelp. Unfortunately, as humans, we only get one brain for our entire life. So it's our job to try to take pretty good care of it. There's a lot of things in life that we routinely perform maintenance on, even though it's something that we can replace eventually, or we're going to have many of them throughout our lives, but our brains are not that way. What we got is what we have, and it's important for us to take care of it. The way that we take care of our minds impacts how we experience our life. So it's really important to invest time and care and to keep them healthy. That could be things like getting adequate rest and taking a nice power nap during the day. That could be doing physical exercise or stimulating your brain through learning new skills and also taking care of your mental health through therapy. So today we're going to be talking about BetterHelp Online Therapy. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers you video, phone, and even live chat only sessions. So if you want to see someone on camera, you can, but you don't have to. You can do it completely through text. It tends to be much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with somebody very quickly. You can have a therapist in under 48 hours. Everybody on the platform is licensed, so this isn't self-help or something like that. This is professional therapy done remotely online. So check it out. Uh, there's a lot of great people on BetterHelp, so you can have a look there. And if you need to change, it's free and quick to do so by just asking them to get you another provider. If you'd like to check out BetterHelp, please go to betterhelp.com slash duff. And as a hardcore self-help podcast listener, you'll get 10% off your first month. Better H-E-L-P, betterhelp.com slash duff. All right, back to the show. All right. So first question reads, hi, Dr. Mr. Senor Monsieur Duff. <laughs> Senor Monsieur. <laughs> Thank you for all that. Yes. Hi. Uh, my partner has birth onset bipolar disorder and schizoaffective disorder, as well as autism. We live in a Southern U.S. state and finding a therapist who's willing to work with her is impossible. She's seen 10 different therapists and better help didn't work. She's recently been remembering and trying to work through a truckload of trauma from her youth while I try to be supportive. It's all we talk about. All roads lead to trauma town. It's getting to a point where I hate talking at all now. I feel horrible asking her to stop, but she needs more than just me, and that's been difficult to find. But I feel like if this keeps up, I'll be wanting I'll stop wanting to be with her. I suffer from severe depression, unmedicated, and it destroys my mental health to talk about nothing but trauma. But I always love her and want to support her best I can. Help. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So good question. Uh, thank you for writing in. Thank you for caring to figure this out and try to figure out the best ways to support her. It's clear that you're not just trying to cut ties and leave. Um, it's, it's admirable for you to, um, you know, want to make things work and try to be better in any way that you can. But it's definitely a tough situation. You know, her not being able to find a appropriate provider. That's very tough. Um, and 
yeah, she has a, a good a smattering of things there that make it a little bit more difficult for that, for finding a provider that can be helpful or that's willing to. I think that your concerns overall are quite valid. I don't want you to be ashamed in asking something like this. Um, it's a lot of emotional burden, burden, burden. <laughs> it's a lot of emotional burden to take on as one person. You know, you care, but you're not her therapist and you have your own limits. That's totally okay. You talked about your own mental health. And, you know, one thing that I want to make sure that you're doing is considering whether you could get some help. You said you're unmedicated. I'm not sure if you're in therapy, but, you know, regardless of her situation, it sounds like you have your own challenges that definitely are worth paying attention to. Definitely, definitely worthy of getting help for. So uh, please do that if you need to. There's, there's nothing wrong with you getting help too. But yeah, um, you know, of the things that you mentioned, bipolar, schizoaffective, autism, I think the autism piece here is uh, a pretty big piece of the equation, uh, I have to imagine. You know, people with autism are all different, but many people that have autism tend to uh, fixate on specific topics or interests. Uh, sometimes this is just in general, kind of very um, obsessive about certain things. Sometimes it's more esoteric, like they have a very specific interest that's different from other people's. But, you know, everybody is different in that regard, even within that spectrum. Um, but yeah, there's a tendency sometimes to fixate a bit. And also, typically, there is some amount of difficulty with, um, you know, understanding the nuances and social graces of communicating with people who are neurotypical. That doesn't come naturally necessarily to them. So this social thing means that your partner may have a hard time reading your cues, you know, things like body language or uh, the sounds you make, um, even certain things that you might say. These would, you know, to me, indicate that, okay, you know, you're getting worn out. You are focusing on something else. Maybe you're topped out in terms of what you can handle with your, your own mental health whatever, sort of those subtle indicators. And these may not come across to her. They may not be something that she's looking out for. So as a result, you know, she has this, you know, very important topic that she is understandably fixated on. And she may not be able to recognize that it's not always appropriate to talk about it so extensively to you or in every situation without checking in, things of that sort. So when you say that you feel terrible thinking about asking her to stop, I understand, you know, you don't want to make her feel like she's doing something wrong. At the same time, you may also be doing her a little bit of a disservice by not saying it plainly, you know, by not saying something very clearly about what you need. As I said, she may not be able to pick up the subtle signs that, you know, you can't handle too much more of this trauma talk. And if that were the case, she wouldn't realize that she's causing you discomfort. I'm sure that she doesn't want to. So, you know, if, if you don't let her know that, you can't assume that she understands. Now, I'm not sure what your communication, you know, with your partner within this relationship is like to begin with. So you're going to need to translate what I'm saying here to whatever fits for you guys. I don't know what forms of communication have been most effective, but definitely use those. But it could be the case that you need to be very clear and straightforward in letting her know that you need to talk less about things related to her trauma. You know, maybe you could say something like, uh, hey, babe, I just want to ask, do you think maybe that uh, we could adjust a bit of the way that we've been talking lately? And then hopefully she'll be like, sure, or what do you mean? And you can say, you know, I, I know that you've been processing and figuring out a lot of things related to what you've been through and sort of the traumatic events in your life. Sometimes I need to be honest, it's a bit too much for me to hear about, you know, as often as I do, we've been talking about it a whole lot. And sometimes for me, that's difficult emotionally. I want to be there for you, but um, at a certain point, it does become too much. So is there a way that I could let you know when I'm not sort of emotionally available for that? Or is there a time, you know, again, translate this to whatever makes sense within the way that you guys talk to each other. But, you know, is there a way that I could tell you uh, when it's not a good time to talk about trauma? And you could work together on that. Um, the, the, the signal or sign or whatever it might be is going to be different from person to person. Um, so maybe it's something as simple as having a hand signal or a safe word, or it's something like, you know, setting up a rule where before you jump into it, maybe, uh, your partner asks you if you're, you know, if you have the space for it, things of that sort, you know, some sort of small way to communicate more about where you're at in this whole process. As I said, this is a, a totally valid concern. You know, you're allowed to be 
concerned about your own mental health. You should be. And setting appropriate boundaries is one good way to care for yourself when you have depression. Um, so if there's a way that she could talk about it that's less intense for you, maybe you can ask her to adjust it in that way. Like, for instance, maybe she doesn't pick up on the fact that she's sharing really, really uh like vivid details that many people would feel uncomfortable with, right? So for instance, I remember I have a, kind of a, a very clear memory of somebody that I worked with in testing, uh, in neuropsych testing, who had PTSD from war, and they were also developing um, less inhibition, meaning they couldn't really hold their behavior back as well because of a dementia condition. And so they would share very, very vivid details about, you know, um, violent things that happened in the war that they fought in. And they would do that with people in public settings, in the grocery store, things like that. And they didn't realize that that was not appropriate, right? So different set of circumstances, but there could be something similar here where maybe you sort of ask her to go into less details about trauma or let her know that you can say when something's getting to be a bit much in the detail department or in the violence department, whatever it might be. Um, but yeah, you know, communicating that, asking her to adjust in some way. I think those are very appropriate things to do and, and working on the communication between you guys might help to avoid misunderstandings, blow ups, things of that sort. Now it's really too bad to hear that she's had a hard time finding a therapist. Um, I'm not sure if she's had trouble finding one online or if this is mainly around your area in person. Just remember that uh, the way licensing works for psychologists and therapists is that you can see somebody anywhere within your state. So maybe you could be searching for therapists, um, you know, that are outside of your immediate area. If you don't have a good pool of providers that are that are there, you could search in places that might have a more appropriate pool of providers, right? So for instance, searching for therapists near a big university in your state or, you know, in a bigger metropolitan area where there's a, there's a larger representation, these might be more fruitful than searching just around you locally. You mentioned BetterHelp uh, that it didn't work. You know, BetterHelp is, I think, a very valuable tool. Obviously, they're a sponsor of the show frequently, but there are limitations. Um, there are limitations when it comes to how intense or complex an issue is. You know, things like autism or schizophrenia, those are going to be difficult to work with on a platform like that. So, you know, I don't want to pretend like just because they're a sponsor, there aren't limitations to it. That's going to be something where, you know, you could potentially make BetterHelp work, but that's going to take some legwork in terms of, you know, making sure that you're making appointments with your therapist where you have live sessions rather than just chatting, things of that sort. But I definitely wouldn't call it the tool of choice for a situation like this. Um, aside from therapy, uh, you know, if you aren't finding the right support within that realm still, maybe you want to broaden your search and look for people like life coaches or even autism specific programs near you or in other states. You know, when you get out of that healthcare sort of relationship that you have in therapy, those borders don't matter as much, right? You could, um, for instance, talk to a life coach that works at an autism center in California, if that would be helpful. So, you know, you can broaden your, your perspective on, on what sort of people might be helpful to work with. And there are also possibly online support groups that you can find for trauma or for autism that could be helpful in terms of giving her another outlet. Um, but you're not wrong. You're not wrong that she needs another way to process this information. You know, you can't be the only one to shoulder all of it. That's not even specifically related to, you know, the autism schizoaffective and things of that sort. That's just sort of in a relationship. You can't be your partner's therapist. I can't be my partner's therapist. So, yeah, um, you know, while you're maintaining the other parts of your relationship, you know, the romantic aspects of it, what have you, that's going to be very difficult if you're also just playing therapist all the time. Again, communicate with her. Try to be as clear as possible. You know, be very clear that she isn't doing anything wrong. You can say that. You're not doing anything wrong and I'm not mad at you. And I'm actually very proud of you for processing all these things, for approaching this scary stuff. At the same time, you know, for my sake, uh, in my own mental health, I need to find a way to, to not talk about trauma all the time. So, you know, if there are concrete alternatives you, you can suggest, like these things that I was just talking about, that would be even better. 
Now, it probably won't solve the entire situation from the start, this communication I'm talking about, but this is a process and you can remind her if it continues to come up like, hey, remember we had talked about this? I think that we still need to nudge a little further in that direction because, um, you know, I'm, I'm having a bit of a hard time here. Um, you know, and maybe there's a good way to signal that you're not ready for trauma talk. Something like, hey, I need a break. <laughs> you know, I need a break from uh, talking about this. Is there another way that we could process this? Maybe you could write some stuff down or we can talk about it when I'm feeling more emotionally stable and available for you. Just sort of uh, being as clear as possible about it. And in the end, you know, as you mentioned, uh, if this continues this way, it might be hard for you to remain in the relationship. That's also okay. Uh, you're allowed to not want to be in the relationship. That doesn't make you selfish or a bad person. I think asking for what you need is a good first step. But if it can't be facilitated, then perhaps this isn't the most healthy relationship for you. And there's nothing wrong with recognizing that. It's not you being judgmental or something like that. It's, you know, um, you recognizing that this just isn't something that's going to be sustainable for you. And that's important. You're, you're, you need to take care of yourself as well. Aside from moving on from the relationship, uh, there's also the possibility that you both need other sources of support and interaction. So if your relationship is the main focal point, if this is your primary source of interaction and social engagement and comfort, uh, then it can be hard to cope with things like you're describing because all of your emotional eggs are sort of in one basket. But if you spread your attention more, you know, your efforts are also elsewhere, you have other things going on in your life, then maybe it's not going to be as intense for you because that's not the only thing that go that's going on, right? So you don't have all of your emotional weight on this one relationship. This is just one amongst the other things in your life that make you you. But overall, I think that you're doing a good job. You know, neither of you are doing anything wrong here. The primary takeaway is that there's nothing wrong with your concerns, but you do probably need to do a bit of a better job at communicating clearly and adapting so that, you know, she has the tools to try to be the best partner to you as well. And then, of course, taking care of your own mental health is another important aspect of this. So thank you for writing in. I appreciate the question and best of luck. Hey, friends, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. Okay, this episode is brought to you by Organifi. Organifi is a line of organic superfood blends that offer plant-based nutrition with high quality ingredients and less than three grams of sugar per serving. Um, they sent me a few different things and I'm a big fan of what they're making. Uh, they sent me their green juice, which is basically to help you de-stress and get set up for the day. They sent me their red juice, which I'll talk about in a second because that one's my favorite. Also their, um, their Organifi Gold, which is uh, basically a, a restful drink to take at night. And then of course, uh, some of their protein. Um, I have been a big fan of the red juice. So one of the things that I'm always on the lookout for is, um, you know, a supplement, a drink, what have you, that can help me have more energy during the day. But that is not caffeine. I drink plenty of caffeine already. I had a Red Bull the other day in the middle of the day. I'm like, who are you right now? Um, but, you know, in the afternoon, I often need a bit of a boost. And so uh, red juice has a lot of ingredients such as beets, freeze-dried berries, uh, cordyceps, which is a medicinal mushroom with adaptogenic qualities, ginseng, reishi mushrooms, um, lots of different stuff in there to help you have sustainable energy without the jitters and things like that that come with caffeine. Um, it does not have a terrible taste either. One of the things with a lot of supplements is the taste isn't all that great. Uh, the red juice tastes great. You know, it's not dissimilar from like a berry drink or even like a Kool-Aid. Definitely not nearly as sweet, but it doesn't have that harsh medicinal flavors that a lot of supplements have. Very easy. You know, you just drop a scoop of it into some cold water, stir it up really good. Um, I like to put ice in there as well and suck it straight down. And then you have uh, some of that energy that you need without the crash that you get from coffee. So Organifi has a ton of products, not just the ones that I mentioned. They also have some seasonal offerings in the pumpkin spice variety that are uh, limited supply, and those will be going quickly. But if you want to check them out, I encourage you to do so. Go check out Organifi's high-quality superfoods without breaking the bank, less than $3 a day here. Go to Organifi.com slash Duff. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I, Organifi.com slash Duff. And if you use the code Duff, you get 20% off your order. So that's Organifi.com slash Duff. Use the code Duff for 20% off any item. All right, back to the show. All right, so on to question two. It reads, hi, Duff. First of all, a huge thank you. Your podcast was and continues to be a huge source of comfort in the 1.5 years since my ADHD diagnosis that has started my mental health journey for good. I've listened to every single episode since. Question, ADHD symptoms on their own are only part of the problem. The guilt and shame attached to them are overwhelming still. What can I do to overcome that? 
background. I'm a female and was only diagnosed at 25 years old, despite meeting all the criteria for ADHD combined. I realized that my self-esteem is built around thinking that every symptom comes from my awful personality, laziness, and uselessness. Now, with the help of my awesome therapist, I'm rebuilding my self-image from scratch, but I still struggle with anxiety. Forgetting things or stumbling on my words creates this visceral sense of fear and guilt that I can't seem to shake. I keep struggling with bouts of depression since childhood. Any thoughts and advice on managing ADHD-related shame? Thank you for your time. I appreciate everything you do for the community. So thank you. Um, wow, every episode. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, that's that's not too much time to catch up on all of that. So uh, you've been listening quite a bit. I appreciate it. Thank you. What you are describing is so common. You know, I think that secondary mental health issues like depression, anxiety, self-esteem problems, these are majorly common in people with ADHD. And I'm so glad you're working with a therapist for that reason. It's actually something a lot of people don't think about or realize should be part of ADHD treatment. You know, they assume that therapy for ADHD would just be all about strategies and tools and skill building, things like that. Um, The attention component, but that's, you know, obviously part of it. But what you're describing is going to be right on the money for a lot of people that that have ADHD or people that work with people who have ADHD, right? Um, There's a lot more to it than just the attentional difficulties or, you know, hyperactivity. In in your case, it sounds like you have a a bit of both. Just to clarify, I still get this question a lot. People say, what's the difference between ADD and ADHD? It's just old terminology. So the, the diagnostic sort of terminology is ADHD. So attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And under that umbrella, you can have the inattentive type, which is, you know, sort of head in the clouds, trouble focusing on things, um, variety of presentations of it, but trouble controlling where your attention goes. You can have the hyperactive, uh, the, the hyperactive form, right? So this is acting out more as a child, uh, a little bit more reckless, impulsive, not too much of a filter, those sorts of things. Or you can have the combined type. So inattentive type, hyperactive type, or combined type, which we have both. So there's not ADD versus ADHD. It's just all into that one umbrella. <clears throat> anyway, uh, to the question asker, you sound very insightful, very aware, very um, cognizant of your situation, which is great. I think it's really going to help you out here because you have a very good understanding of what's going on. For one, I would suggest maybe getting involved in some ADHD communities online. There are a lot of great websites. I know, for instance, Attitude Mag, ADD Attitude, AttitudeMag.com. I think that's the website. You could just Google it. But Attitude Mag uh, has a, a good website. There are forums. There are obviously you know subreddits and things like that. Uh, there are a lot of communities out there for people with ADHD, and they share resources, information, support, and even just sort of like blog post style perspectives like your own, which can help you feel you know normalized and not alone. It can be validating. You're definitely not alone in your experience here. It's very common, actually, at least, you know, here in the U.S. for women with ADHD, and maybe it is the same in other countries as well. I have to assume it probably is, but uh, for, you know, women with ADHD to not be identified as readily or as easily as men, um, very similar situation to what we see in people with autism, where the symptoms are there, but maybe they present differently um, depending on what sort of social role you fill, right? So we tend to look for obvious signs of ADHD. So some of the more subtle or internalized symptoms, ones that are, um, you know, more presented in, a, in sort of a, not a gendered way, because gender doesn't necessarily have the biggest thing to do with it, but sort of the role, right? The, the social role that you play, as I said. Um, they can fly under the radar, these symptoms. And, you know, especially if you're smart or able to find your way through school effectively, despite, you know, this, the struggle you're having, it can really be um, something that's not recognized for a long time and then blamed on other things. And I think that's the case for you, right? You have um, all these things that were not identified as a you know, neurodivergence as something that's actually different about your brain and instead just based on you as a person. So it's like, you're in trouble for this. You're in trouble for that. You're judged for this. You're judged for that. And it's you as a person, not these symptoms that you're having because those symptoms weren't called out or recognized. So it makes a lot of sense why you would build sort of a self-concept based on these things. Um, 
I think that um, one thing that could be a very helpful part of your journey here would be to start labeling and calling out these negative thought patterns that you talked about. So basically trying to externalize them and recognize that, you know, they're a thought that you're having, but not necessarily the truth about you as a person. And as I said, it's understandable why you would have these things. You know, the situation for you makes a lot of sense, but it, it still stands that these are things that you're thinking. These aren't necessarily truths about yourself. So for example, if you find that you are thinking that somebody thinks you're stupid, right? You're like, oh, they must think I'm so stupid because I stumbled over my words or, you know, said something that didn't make sense. Try to catch yourself. And instead of calling yourself stupid, instead of saying, God, you're so stupid. Why would you do that again? Say, okay, I am thinking that I'm stupid. I'm projecting my fears of being lazy or dumb onto other people again, right? I am not letting them tell me. I'm assuming I know what they think about me. These are all very related to my my thinking traps that I write about often. So if you just go to the website and look up thinking traps, you could find resources, podcast episode, free ebook, all that sort of stuff. But, you know, there's a lot of mind reading that probably goes on where you're just assuming that you understand what somebody feels about you or what they're thinking about you, when in reality you don't unless you talk to them about it. But yeah, call these things out. Like, oh, I'm doing that thing again. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm assuming again, or I'm projecting, or I'm, you know, uh, treating this person like they uh, have known me forever or whatever, whatever it is, just say it either to yourself in your head out loud, or later on, you could write it down in your journal, um, whatever it is, just call it out for what it is, what's happening. Not that this is a part of you, but what is happening, what you're thinking, what you're feeling and all of that. Uh, you could also go further and you could investigate the evidence for these things, right? So has anybody in the present, not in the past, but has anybody in the present told you recently that you've done something dumb or embarrassing or you're so difficult to understand or that they don't want to be around you? Any of these things. Are there any concrete pieces of evidence that tell you you should be concerned here? Or does this all require a lot of interpretation and extrapolation? You're like, well, you know, I talked to this person once and they didn't text me back. Doesn't necessarily mean what you think it means. It could, but do you actually have any concrete information that supports that? So doing a little bit of cognitive behavioral work here is basically what we're doing. And that can be helpful to sort of poke holes in this and, and realize the areas where you're just making a lot of assumptions based on your early experiences rather than what's going on right now. Um, and remember, you know, when you assume that you know why somebody or how somebody feels about you, you know, you think that they are thinking something in particular about you or you know how they feel, that's not really giving them the benefit of the doubt because you didn't ask them. You're essentially doing to them what you're afraid of them doing to you, right? Because you assume that they are making assumptions about you, <laughs> right? And that's exactly what you're doing to them. So you're not giving them a chance. You're just assuming that they're thinking about you negatively. Of course, this is all happening in your head. So don't need to feel guilty about it. It's not like you're saying, oh, you're so mean, right? You're mostly doing this in your brain. So you're not hurting their feelings by making these assumptions, just hurting your own. And I think it can definitely impact the way that you behave and the way that you interact. Um, it can be a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Because you can treat them differently because you assume they think of you a certain way. I would also encourage you to do the opposite and start to pay more attention to the good things about yourself and even document them, write them down. Keep a note in your phone and tap things in every once in a while. But things like the times you made somebody laugh or when there was a task that was difficult to accomplish, but you found a way to do it. Um, friendships, relationships that you've been able to build and keep over time, the ways in which you haven't allowed yourself to be limited by your symptoms, all of those, you know, we do a lot of mental filtering where we notice the negative stuff, but if you force yourself and you continue to practice it, you can start to notice more of the positive stuff as well. And you don't need to become this sort of inflated ego, unrealistically positive person, but you know, balance the scales a little bit. You do a really good job of putting yourself down. So injecting a little bit of this optimism or positivity isn't being, you know, annoying and rosy. This is just leveling the playing field a bit and being more realistic. Um, you know, obviously the reasons that you started therapy are painful to you and you've had a hard time with, but I mean, how cool is it that you're handling this? I think that 
you know, you as a person, regardless of the ADHD or the depression, anxiety symptoms, you're doing more personal work than many people will ever have the will to do. And I think that's super cool. It's super admirable. And I think overall, that makes you a much more interesting person. Even, you know, if there was no reason for it and you were just doing all this self-exploration because you thought it was cool, definitely. <laughs> yeah, I think that makes you a very interesting person. There's a lot of power, though, in this. There's a lot of power in you recognizing what's going on and trying to not let it limit your life. I think there's also power in owning your diagnosis, um, if that's something that you want to do, right? But if this is something that you are taking back your power from and not trying to limit you, that's awesome. And you don't have to feel ashamed about that. You can own it, you know, wear it on your chest. Um, this is probably something that gives you some quirks. You know, you're different from people who don't have ADHD and that's not always a bad thing. There are definitely some positives to that and just some quirks that are interesting and different. I think that life would be extremely boring if everybody interacted the same way socially. So having a little bit of flavor isn't always a bad thing. Um, but you can call it out, you know, this is a part of you. And so when the ADHD symptoms are sort of rearing their head in a social situation, uh, you can, you know, basically combat that visceral fear and guilt that you talked about by just being a little humorous about it, right? If you stumble on your words or forget something, you could always make a joke like, all right, ADHD brain is out to play today. You know, brain is in overdrive. You know, you could say, thank you for being my friend because I drive myself crazy. How do you do it? Whatever, you know, you don't have to put yourself down. And obviously we're talking about whatever's appropriate for your personality and the relationship with the person that we're talking about. But yeah, there's nothing wrong with calling it out. You don't need to justify your existence. You're not doing anything wrong here, but you're allowed to be casual about it. This is part of who you are. It's something that sometimes gets in the way. It's something that makes, you know, uh, you uniquely suited for certain things. And sometimes it might create funny situations for you. So there's nothing wrong with owning that. The thing we want to watch out for is avoiding social situations because you assume that you're going to make a fool of yourself or that you're going to be embarrassed or any of these things, right? And as I mentioned, you can have self-fulfilling prophecies here. So in this case, you know, you might assume that you have no friends because of your ADHD, but in reality, maybe you don't have friends because you won't let yourself socialize for fear that people are going to think you're strange or annoying. So it's sort of a roundabout way. It's not the symptoms themselves that are causing you to not have friends. It's the fact that you feel so poorly about yourself because of those symptoms and because of your past that you're not giving yourself the chance to socialize. And so then, you know, you don't have a lot of friends and you say, see, told you, you know, nobody wants to be friends with me. Not sure if that's the case for you, but it's just one example of avoiding things. We want to try to not avoid things. You know, the more you engage, the more you are allowing yourself to be out there and do those things that are a bit difficult for you, the more you realize this isn't a limitation. It's not something that people are judging you for as harshly as you're judging yourself, and it will become easier over time. And on the time part, I just want to say for the last thing that you're going to have to have some patience. You're doing a lot of deep work here. You're dismantling a lot of beliefs about yourself and um, things that have very, you know, understandable origins, but they're deep seated and that can take some time. I think that you're absolutely on the right track with therapy and doing the work that you're doing. So keep it up and this will become easier and easier. Uh, I'm really excited for you though. I think that you're on a great path and very good job finding those resources and doing what you need to do. So thank you for writing that in. With that, that is the end of the episode, everybody. This has been episode 314 of the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast. If you want the show notes for this episode, go to deathlesspsych.com slash episode 314. If you want to send me a question for a future episode, send me an email to deathlesspsych at gmail.com. Take care of yourselves out there. Have a good rest of your week, and I will see you for the next episode. Bye.